Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today we're back on our lovely old China Blue machine. Why? Well, I've decided to wreck it. I've pulled it all to pieces because today we're going to have what I like to call an acrylic fest. What that means is there's lots of unanswered questions which I've been batting around for probably best part of a year or more. Things like striation marks on the edge, whether or not changing the focal depth has any effect on the cut depth. All sorts of questions like that associated with acrylic. Now the last time you saw me playing with acrylic it was with a, a, a bit of a, a bodge mechanism that I made up with a lead screw. It sort of worked and I got the impression that it was running at a steady speed, but I'm still never sure. I didn't actually test it to see whether it was running at a steady speed. So today I'm going to start off with something which I've designed, which I hope will now answer the questions that we left unanswered at that point in time. Now I was trying to produce absolutely step-free steady motion with a small lead screw and a synchronous AC motor which runs off the mains through a very large gearbox to make sure that we get absolutely steady rotational speed and that motor is then acting through a positive acting lead screw, a multi-start lead screw. Now this time I've mounted the lead screw in a couple of bearings so that it runs absolutely true and steady um, and I've also driven it off of a motor here which is not fixed to the actual mechanism itself. So the motor can wobble around and do what it wants but the lead screw cannot. If you look carefully here you'll see that we're on the end of this bearing slide there are a couple of rubber pads on the end, scraper pads, and I've made a little shoe which fits over the rubber pads and is smaller than the overall length so that there is no play in this head. It's a little bit of compression there. So I've tried to remove every possible way that we're going to get slop or random motion in the mechanism. I've just clamped it on the top here because it doesn't need to be any more than that. It's only got to be constrained from moving in this direction so that we get good movement in the head. Now the only problem with this mechanism is this motor does not have any reversing mechanism on it and yet it's another reason why I've allowed the motor freedom so that I can disconnect it from this flexible piece of tube coupling and then wind this head back and having wound the head back we then plug the motor in again. What I've had to do as well is to disconnect the bearing assembly, the belt. <coughs> now all I'm really doing is using the head and the bearing system and I'm trying to create a absolutely silky smooth linear drive as opposed to a stepper motor drive. I'm only going to have to have it over sort of what have we got here about maybe 100, 120 mil but that'll be enough to test what we want. Now I have disconnected the belt for a very good reason. I don't mind this machine moving in Y although I shan't be moving it in Y. You'll see my X stepper motor here and when I drive it left and right you can see that it's still working. Now because it's an open loop system it doesn't know that it's not connected to the head. So this does allow me a little bit of flexibility. I can actually send a program to the machine which I am going to be doing later and I'm going to try and fool the machine to do something that I want to test. I've already checked out the speed of motion that I get from here and it is nine millimeters a second. I can change the power and that's all I can do. That's a little bit limiting. Now the last time I ran this you might remember that I got the worst possible cutting results that I'd ever had on acrylic. Now did I believe it or didn't I believe it? Well I thought I was running at a steady speed but when I think about it afterwards I didn't actually carry out a steady speed test. It is actually a very simple test that we can carry out using a piece of acrylic. 
Acrylics are wonder material, as you know, and this is all about acrylic this session. Here I've got a piece of extruded acrylic, which is eight millimeters thick. And as you can see, it's crystal clear. And I think you might be able to catch in the light that is not exactly many marks on the edge. There is just a hint of striations on there, but it's been very nicely flame polished with virtually no air assist and running at very slow speed. Now, the only reason I've left the material, the plastic on, is because here in the UK and Europe, they tend to make acrylic in two types, casts and extruded. The cast normally has a manufacturer's name on it, which gives you the clue that it's cast acrylic. Whereas when you get extruded acrylic, they don't put any side or name to it. It is just covered in this film. When you cut it, there's a definite burr on both the top and the bottom edge of the cut. It's very easy to get a mirror polish on extruded acrylic, and it's very difficult to get a mirror polish on cast acrylic. We're gonna start off with the easiest material to work with, which is the extruded acrylic. And because this has got a really nice clear edge on it, I'm going to use this edge to check the speed. I'm starting off using a two inch lens in this machine and as you can see I've got zero air assist on here. All I need is a slightly longer piece of pipe and we can have air assist on here. What we're trying to achieve is a completely uniform and level cut into the material. Now if I get wavy shapes it means the head is moving like this because when the head stops, the beam will cut deeper. I need to have a uniform cut along here to prove that I've got a uniform speed along here. And there's no point in me pressing the X button to get that lined up because I have no control over X. What I have got is a switch here, which allows me to turn that motor on and off. So we'll have the pulse button now, pulse on, I haven't put the extractor on at the moment, but we'll do that in a minute. I'll run it for as long as I can, and I'll just watch the top before it crashes into the end stop. There we go. Now we haven't got a through cut here. We've got a closed cut, and a closed cut always causes a ploughed field effect along the bottom here. But what we're more interested in is not the roughness of the surface, but the uniformity of the line itself. We can see clearly we've got a uniform cut. We've got uniform power. So how can I have striations in the background and those striations are also showing signs of drag. Now I'm using fairly low power in here so it does mean to say that I'm not generating a huge amount of heat in the cut itself. So consequently the cut has not had a chance to uh, melt and heal over the striations. Now I'll talk about the melting process and the healing process in a few minutes but let's go and observe what this first test has shown us. I've hacked away the front edge of the material here. I've ground away the bottom and broken it so that I don't damage this surface internally here. Okay, so that we can see the striations. Well, this is probably one of the most difficult things I've ever tried to show you. There are some rather faint striations on there. Oh, there we, there we go. Look, at the bottom left-hand corner there, you can clearly see the striations coming down and curling away at the bottom. I think the first question we have to ask is, how is it possible to get these striations when we don't have any intermittent movement, we don't have any pulsing air, and we know we've got a steady beam because we can see the line is flat as it cuts its way into that material. There may be some, uh, what could I call it, turbulence in the bottom of the cut, but that probably is caused by um, the gas messing with the liquid phase of the acrylic that's in the bottom there. Now I've got some rather nice acrylic blocks here which I'm very happy to destroy for the sake of science 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire that same 15% laser beam at that surface there. And what I'd like you to do is just observe what happens. Now we've done this before, but I'm going to hold the pulse button on. Now 15% probably will be enough energy instantly turn this surface here to liquid, but before you even see any liquid, it'll evaporate. Now you can see it's still evaporating, but sooner or later, look, you can just see around the outside here, can you see that liquid forming now? Here's what we've just produced. And as you can clearly see, we've got a point at the bottom, which is where the high energy density is in the beam. But as we get further and further out, we get lower and lower energy density. I hoped you notice that it was only when the beam was fairly well established and we'd burnt quite a long way in that the high energy part of the beam that was doing evaporation was not the part of the beam that was causing the liquid. The liquid was only happening right at the outside where the energy is very low. But it happened a long time after we started the beam. We held the beam on for a long time. So you have to build up heat in the cut to get a polished cut. Now we're going to talk about this later and we're going to demonstrate beam polishing but I want you to understand and remember this little picture here that it took a long time for the liquid to form around the outside of this cone. Now this is the low energy side of the beam and of course we're talking about the high energy side of the beam but the only difference between this side of the beam and the other side of the beam is the fact that this shape is not 6 millimeters diameter as it is here, but it's only about 0.2 millimeters diameter when it comes out of the nozzle. So there's a big energy amplification difference between what you see here and what you see down there, but it's much easier to see what's going on here, slow motion but it's no different than what happens after the lens. The beam comes out the nozzle and the focus basically sends the beam down to a focus point like this. And at this point here, which is where we're currently focused, that's where we get the smallest possible beam. After that, it starts expanding quite rapidly. We can demonstrate that very easily. Now here's how the beam is growing between 20 and 26 mil. Quite a big difference as you can see. Okay, so here's the top of the block and we're looking up into the front of the block and upwards. So I'm gonna fire a beam into that block with the distance, the correct focal distance. Hmm, there we go. Now, that's about six millimeters deep. Does that look as though it's bent? No. Well, I'm going to increase the pulse time now to 50 milliseconds, a 20th of a second. Does that look like a parallel hole that I've drilled in there? And that's a hole that's probably 12, 10 or 12 millimeters deep. Can I just point this out to you? That's a change from 18 to 26. This is a change from 18 to probably closer to 30. Look at the diameter change that's occurred between 20 and 26. So what's going on? We have a light beam that's coming down and causing an interaction with the surface and causing the material to vaporize, leaving a hole behind. But as soon as it vaporizes the first part of the hole, the laser beam does not expand. It internally reflects as though it was a um, light pipe, a fiber optic. Now, fiber optic work because of different densities of material and so basically we have got air as one density and a much higher density around it. So we're getting complete internal reflection of the beam as it passes into the material. And so that beam 
as focused at the surface and it does not lose its focus as it goes 12 millimeters into the material. Look, you can see that, it's the same diameter. I'm now gonna try and demonstrate to you how I think that beam drag is actually occurring. So, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse. Now I think it's very important that you watch this piece of video again because after the formation of the very first cone you'll see the way in which the erosion takes place on the leading edge of the cut and gradually folds itself backwards. But more important than that, what I want you to watch is the gas dynamics inside the cut. You'll see swirling action, plus you'll find that there is what looks like a film, a liquid film, very thin liquid film moving around. Now it may be gas that's condensing, but whatever it is, it is, you can see after every cut that it leaves a striation mark. So, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse. Following on from this, I want you to just take a quick look at a piece of enclosed gas dynamics when the laser beam goes straight down a hole. Okay, so there's a demonstration of the gas dynamics that takes place around the laser beam itself in acrylic. You've previously seen the way in which the laser beam gets deflected by the acrylic. So if you add those two things together, I think we've got a fairly reasonable explanation, a logical explanation, of how beam drag is occurring in my closed cut. Now this is a great demonstration of how striations can be formed with a pulsing mechanism. Now pulsing could either be a stepper motor edging forward which is basically what I've simulated here or if you've got one of the professional machines which uses an RF tube then they've got control of the frequency of the pulses although they may well have silky smooth DC motors the pulsing of the laser beam itself can cause exactly the same problem. They've got the opposite problem to what I've got on this machine. And the way that they overcome it is they change the frequency. And so you can inject very high frequencies in and so your pulses basically become so high that you don't actually see the striations. Although we've seen the creation of striations, although we've seen beam drag being demonstrated, we haven't answered my fundamental question associated with my partial depth cut. And that is, why am I getting striations when I've got constant speed and I've got constant power and I've got no air assist? There must be some other mechanism that's taking place. Now, I was anticipating that this acrylic fest was going to be just a longish one session job, but hey, I've fallen over at the first hurdle here. I haven't been able to answer why am I getting striations on this surface here. So I feel we're now going to have to be distracted by trying to find out what's going on to produce these marks here. But apart from the preparation of this part here, 
I've done no preparation or pre-thinking for this session. It's all exactly as you see it. It's discovery, it's coming across problems and having to answer the questions. But this time I don't want to skip over the problem, I really want to try and investigate in depth so that we come to what I consider to be a real conclusion. Now I'm not going to say that it is the conclusion because you are going to see exactly the same things that I'm going to see and you can draw your own conclusions from that evidence. So with my distance 18 millimeters, that's the correct focal distance for that particular, for this nozzle, um, I'm going to burn a pulse into the surface, 50 milliseconds, 20th of a second long. We can see it just here. That's all I really need to do at the moment, but while we're doing this experiment, what I'm going to do is to move the head along a little bit. I'm going to drop the head from 18 to 17 to 16, 22, 23. Now using exactly the same power, exactly the same focal point, but this time I've changed to a piece of paper. Now this is the hole we punch through the paper at the correct focus point. Um, I've put a piece of red paper behind the white paper so that you can see the size of the hole as opposed to the burn stroke scorch halo that's around the outside. Now you can see the scorch halo is what well, it's about 0.7 maybe 0.8 diameter quite large it just shows you the influence of what's going on around the outside of the laser beam itself at the focus point this is a plano convex lens that i've got in here so it's not particularly um well focused and as you can see the hole itself the very high energy part of the beam is approximately 0.2 diameter. Here's exactly the same beam fired at the acrylic. Now as you can see there is a slight tapering at the mouth of the acrylic so it looks as though the hole that's produced is about 0.5 so that's 18 this one's 17 we're dropping the beam down, 16, 15, 14, 13, and we're producing a bit of a strange funnel effect. But once the beam is into the material, it seems to be pretty consistent. So there was 18 again just for reference quite a nice clean entry at the top there so let's go from 18 we'll take the focus up rather than down so at 19 we've got a pretty straight entry as we start to increase the focal distance we get a bit of a change to the shape of the entry and we get quite a big change to the depth of the cut as you can see here 22 on the right and 23 you know these are pretty abysmal so that's just a set of interesting observations while I was punching this one hole in and the reason why I'm punching this one hole in is because this is the one that's important to me and uh, just to confirm that our readings are right um, we'll take a plan view look at the hole the end of the hole this is the entry to the hole and sure enough the hole is about 0.5 diameter yep so our side view and our plan view agree but now it's time to reflect on some of the results that we've just seen before we can really start analyzing those results I must go back and reinforce something that I've spoken of many times before for those people that just drop in and drop out of these um, sessions uh, they're gonna they basically lose so much of the background data and also this is quite a difficult concept for some people to understand. Now the laser beam itself is a beam of concentrated invisible light. Now that's concept number one that people seem difficult, have difficulty understanding, how, can, how you can have light but it's not there. Just accept the fact that there is something there because when you put your hand in the way it'll get burnt, if you put a piece of paper in the way it'll get burnt 
there's energy there that does something. And that energy in that beam is not uniform. Like this light here, it is concentrated in the middle, as I'm showing you there, but it gets dull towards the outside where there's less and less light. So this is a concept called energy density. We've got much higher levels of energy in the middle here of the beam than we have on the outside of the beam. Bear with me for a few moments because I'm going to turn this picture around and I'm going to ask you to imagine that this is a rain cloud. And this is the amount of rain that's in the rain cloud. It's heavy in the middle because there's a lot of rain in the middle of that black cloud. It's spring, it's showery, and the rain is going to pass overhead. Now I think you can immediately see that just at this point here, if you're standing underneath at that point, you're going to get absolutely soaked because we're going to get a mini flood just here. Whereas at the outside of the cloud here, there's going to be hardly any rain falling at all. Not enough to even water your carrots. With that little concept in mind of rain, not much rain coming down here and a lot of rain coming down here in the middle, Let's turn the picture back round again. And instead of rain, it's light. I know they're not the same thing, one is solid and one is not, but the principle is the same. We've got amounts of energy, amounts of water, whatever you want to call it, there's a variable density of things that are happening inside this beam. When that beam hits a surface, two things can happen. First of all, it could be reflected off like a mirror, and, and that does happen for metals. But we're talking about acrylic, which is a non-metal, and it's a rather special type of non-metal material, which has got some interesting properties. So let's not worry about other materials, let's just stay with the principle of acrylic. And what will happen is, this energy, this rain, will fall on the surface in the middle here, and instead of causing a flood, this light, it's a rather special light, infrared, which reacts with things and causes them to get excited. Now, all molecules are busy just sitting there like this at room temperature. If you start exciting them with extra energy, they get faster. And as they get faster vibrations, their temperature goes up. So what we're actually doing here, we're firing light at the surface of the acrylic and we're exciting the acrylic molecules on the surface. And that is the critical word that I want you to remember, surface. On the surface, we're exciting those molecules and those molecules then raise their temperature. Now, if we go back to the rain idea and the density idea, we've got a lot more rain, a lot more energy falling in the middle here than we have at the outside, we've got just a few little bits of energy falling here and lots of energy in the middle. And so what happens is there'll be not much heating effect on the acrylic out here at the edge, but a huge amount of heating taking place just in the middle where we've got the highest energy density. I've drawn this shape in here as the energy profile of the beam, but you mustn't regard this energy profile as being something like a drill. It doesn't automatically produce that same shape in the material. Approximately, approximately it does. But the principle is really, we're looking at this as energy density, not as an actual shape. So what happened is the heating takes place on these surface molecules here, and where we've got very high energy density, the excitement will be great, and we will instantly heat these molecules up, and they will evaporate. They will go through a liquid phase very, very quickly and immediately turn into vapor. Now, as they turn into vapour, what will happen is we will have a piece of clean acrylic left behind. And that clean acrylic is a hard surface. And that hard surface will again be excited by the light that's falling on it. The molecules will heat up and they will in turn evaporate. So although we've got very high energy in the middle here, we mustn't forget that we've also got energy out here as well. And as time goes on, this energy on the outside here will have time to have an effect as well. So gradually, 
we will get a bigger and bigger erosion. And this is what's happening. It's an erosion that's taking place on this surface. And we've seen that erosion. There it is. Look, they're all over the place where I keep testing things. And as we saw in this hole that we made here, after a certain period of time, nope, I'm using the word time again, there was enough time to allow even this part of the low energy to start heating up the edge of the material. And that was just enough temperature there to keep that part in its liquid phase. Whereas down here, there was enough energy to push it through its liquid phase and make it disappear into a vapor because we've got very high energy density here. The light in itself is harmless, but it has to interact with the surface to change its energy form from light to heat. It in itself does not heat. It only stimulates the material that it hits to heat up. Okay, so we've got that piece of science out the way. Now we're coming back to our subject that we're looking at, which is where these striation marks come from. We burn a 0.2 diameter hole in a piece of paper. Now with exactly the same power, exactly the same focus point, and exactly the same amount of time, we pushed it into a piece of acrylic. And the end result was that the acrylic produced a hole which was 0.5 diameter. So why the difference when I fire that beam into a piece of acrylic? We'd previously seen the gas dynamics taking place in that tube there when we fired the laser beam into it and held the power on. You could see the gases swirling around inside there. And we also saw exactly the same sort of dramatic gas dynamics that were taking place when we were producing our beam drag experiment. So we have to assume that the reason why this hole has grown from 0.2, which appears to be the beam diameter, to 0.5 is the fact that we've got some sort of interaction between the acrylic and the laser beam, which is causing some sort of gas cloud around the outside of it. The heating effect, plus possibly, and this could also be a possibility, none of this is fact because all this is supposition based on what we've seen. We have a laser beam coming in, and remember, it has internal reflection because the pipe is continuously focusing down. And so we've got complete internal reflection there. Now it's possible that every time that we get a reflection, we may well get some of this erosion taking place. And that may well be the reason why we're getting a bigger diameter hole. So this is garage science. This is not NASA laboratory science. And going from point two to point five, leaves me with the impression that what we could assume is that there is no solid material here for this laser beam to react with. Now, the laser beam itself, as I said, has to react with solid material, a solid clean surface. It has to excite atoms. And if all we've got is a gas cloud here, it might excite the gas cloud but it's not doing anything to remove material from the edge of our solid block. So when the laser beam starts to move that way, nothing happens until this high powered central part of the beam at least starts to get involved with solid material again here. Now at that point, we're gonna start generating another cloud like that. And then it's going to carry on jumping across this void of nothing, which it can't erode until it gets to here. When again, it produces a cloud of gas like this. Now, this is going to continue ad infinitum while we're carrying out the cut. But look what we've got here. These little nodes here. I'm proposing that those are the nodes that are the striations. So this mechanism that I'm describing here 
is exactly the same mechanism that takes place when you cut mild steel with an oxygen assist gas. And it's a well researched and proven subject. Now when I first spoke about it probably a couple of years ago it was supposition. I was relating that subject to our acrylic. There are some doubters but now I think I've done enough work and understand enough about the laser beam itself to be fairly confident that this mechanism, this same mechanism, does actually exist in acrylic. But everything that you've seen today indicates this direction. Whether I cut smoothly or whether I cut with a juddery action, the same mechanism is going to take place. It may be exaggerated or they may be aliasing between these patterns and the pulsing of the laser beam or the frequency of the stepper motor. So we may get some rather strange and random patterns, but the underlying striations are produced by this mechanism here I'm proposing. So how do we get rid of these striations on a cut? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. We've already discovered the answer, and that is we allow enough time for heat to build up on the edge of the cut. And heat building up on the edge of the cut means we shall get a liquid film taking place. And that liquid film will naturally want to smooth out and take away the peaks. But it does depend on heat being retained in the cut itself. So if you cut too fast, you will probably create striations. These are the sorts of things that we're now going to investigate. We know that this is cast perspex because it's got labelling on it. As I mentioned before, no labelling generally means extruded. And I think you'll be able to see that from the edge finish that's on there. That's a sort of a milky matte finish. It's got, if I turn it to the light and I catch it right, you'll probably see that it has got striations in it. I'm going to run lots of tests, but I'll just show you the important ones and we'll discuss the results. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the limitations of this test is the speed. I'm fixed at nine millimeters a second. So there are limited parameters that I can check out. So we're going to use this one and a half inch lens to start with without air assist. You'll know when air assist is on because listen, you can hear it. I'm not going to run any extraction because there is so little in the way of fumes and you'll be able to see whether the fumes are coming out the bottom if it's made a through cut. So we're running this on full power about 70% and 9 millimeters a second. This is cast acrylic. To make sure I don't lose track of what I'm doing, I'm going to put a mark on the edge that is our cut edge, and I'll make a note on the bottom here of what it is. We'll go and look at those later. So now we'll run the same test again, but we'll run it with air assist. Although the pump is a pulsing pump, because it goes through so many restrictions and the flow that comes out here is nothing like that coming out of the pump or what the pump is capable of, Basically what comes out here is a pretty smooth flow. I think if you listen, you can hear that there's no real serious indication of pulsing. Well that's a little bit unexpected, but I would say that that's probably slightly better with air assist than without air assist. We'll go and catch that in some sunlight in a minute and you can compare the difference for yourself. We'll now drop the power right down to the other extreme because at the moment I've got the power set as high as I can to try and get as much heat as possible into the cut. Remember, if we can keep heat in the cut we shall have a, um, we shall have a liquid film in there which heals the surface over. 
and helps to cure any striations. Now the other thing that absolutely guarantees that this is cast acrylic is when I rub my finger across that corner there, both top and bottom, there is zero in the way of burr. It's an absolutely crisp, sharp corner. We've dropped the powder to 30% now, no air assist. Beginning to get a little bit of striation on there now because we haven't got as much heat energy in the cut. It's still shiny. I wouldn't say that it's polished, it's just nice and shiny. But again, we'll see that when we look at them and do comparisons. So now I'm expecting maybe this is going to be rough when I do it with air assist. Well, it's <laughs> surprisingly, it's shiny and striated. It's nicely polished, but with marks in it. Now, cast acrylic's the difficult stuff to polish. We have got some striations on the edge there. We've also got some polishing, which is quite remarkable, considering I was expecting it to be a frosted finish as soon as we put some air on it. I know that this is extruded acrylic because A, when I feel the edge here, I can feel the burr both top and bottom. And secondly, I can see that even though I did this on my light blade machine with no particular caution or care, it's really a very nice, shiny, polished finish without even trying. Now, we know that it just about worked at 20% with cast acrylic. We'll run up the scale this time from 20% upwards. Well, that mirror polished with some striations in the background. And the edge, when I feel it, the edge is warm but not hot. So we'll try the same thing with air assist now. Okay, now we'll do something slightly different. We'll go for a piece of coloured perspex. So that was with air assist on the light blade machine, no particular care at all. So here we are, we're going to do 70% no air assist on a piece of cast, a black acrylic. All I can say is it's matte, smoothish, with a few striations in it. When I compare it to the other side that was done on the light blade, no comparison, this is actually better. I suppose it's a sort of a satin sheen finish to it. Not much in the way of striations, but just a hint of. So 70% with air assist now. Smooth, satin finish. A few hints of odd striations, but a very nice finish. Before we go and examine all those results, I can already get a feeling for the fact that it really doesn't make any difference whether we have cast acrylic or extruded acrylic. We still get, to a greater or lesser extent, striations. Some of them are very, very faint. Some of them are slightly more pronounced than others. But the question we still have to ask is, why are we getting striations when we've got absolutely smooth power and absolutely smooth velocity? So I think we must conclude, as we did earlier, that this is all to do with the gas dynamics. Now the one thing we haven't tried, which we will, just to complete the exercise, is a piece of extruded black acrylic, which I think I've got. Now that's quite a nice hot cut there. I can feel it. I wouldn't want to hold my hand on there for too long. It's certainly, I suppose people would class that as mirror polish, but I'm looking at it extremely critically and saying, 
Well, I can still see a few striations in the background there. We've got a full set of data there, cast, extruded, cast, extruded, both clear and black. So we can look at the edge comparisons for those with and without air assist. Okay, now we're going from one extreme to the other. We've now got a two and a half inch lens in there, two and a half inch meniscus lens. And uh, we're going to see whether or not 70% power is enough with this huge distance here to burn through this six millimeter, uh, probably something like five and a half millimeter thick acrylic. with almost miraculous results. The, the, we can still see some marks in there, but these are definitely more, uh, what can I say, softer, mirror polished. So I don't know whether you can see those marks on just there, there's a few just there. Basically that's pretty good. Yeah, there's still just a hint there of the burr top and bottom even though it's a lovely soft cut. Okay now having established that we've got a lovely soft cut with that lens what I want to do is something completely different. Now I've now programmed this machine to draw a line. So if I press the origin button I know that I'm going to get no movement in Y. The machine doesn't know where X is, it's, it's wherever X happens to be. And when I run the program, the X drive is going to run, but of course I'm going to get no motion here. So I should be able to switch my control on and off, and whatever I've programmed into the machine will happen down here. Now I'm going to be using dot mode, because what I want to do is to produce a series of pulses, downward pulses, to see if I can cut this off with pulses. Basically what I'm trying to do is to start simulating what happens with one of the professional machines where they have a pulsing laser beam. Now I don't, well I'm absolutely certain I won't be able to get up to 20 kilohertz pulse frequency that they can achieve, but we might be able to get a little way into that range and see what effect it has on the cut. So at the moment, what I've done, I've got it set to a dot time of 0.1, which is 100 milliseconds, which we know is plenty to pierce through because we've seen this piercing into a block. Now the dot interval has got nothing really to do with this because I've got no linear control of this axis. It runs at nine millimeters Per second. Thinking about it, I'm not sure that we should be able to change the frequency of the dots here. We'll give it a try. We'll, we'll see what happens. Now I think I might put air assist on because I suspect it's going to flame up. This produced a nail file. So those are pretty big Uh, let's call them striations, shall we? <laughs> but they're not natural, they're forced striations because they're nice and straight, straight down. But it's lovely and polished as well. So question is, can I change the dot frequency, I wonder? I have no ability to change the pulse frequency. So here's the trick that I'm just trying to play on the machine. The machine thinks it's going to scan a square somewhere out here and it's going to do it at one millimeter per second. So it's going to take a long time to do a single scan. But what I've also asked it to do, to run at 70% in special mode. So that means technically I suppose I'm running with 50% power. It should be running with a frequency of about 20k. So if this is in any way successful it should be a fairly close simulation to what an RF tube can do. Oh, we got something. Didn't burn through quite. 
but it gives us an idea maybe of what possibly could be achieved with a Trotec, Epilog, Universal Machine, those sorts of machines that use high frequency pulsing. But of course I can't really say at the moment because we haven't burnt all the way through. The only thing that I can possibly do is to use thinner material. Now this looks like three millimeter clear. But I have to assume that from its lovely shiny finish that it must be um, extruded acrylic. Now I can try a proper piece of extruded acrylic but even so it's still got smooth with striations on it. Now I'm obviously not properly simulating anything that's done by the big companies. I might be running at 20 kilohertz but of course I haven't got the right, I haven't got the same sort of beam. Um, they've probably got a much sharper focused beam than I've got because they've got a smaller a beam to start with. Now these last four black ones are extruded acrylic. Now can you tell which ones are done with air assist and which ones are done without air assist? They're all basically the same as each other. As you can see there is just a hint of striations on the surface. Now the next four black ones along, again, is there any difference between them? Two of them are done at 70%, two of them are done at 20% and there's a mix of air assist and non air assist in there. Again, you can't tell the difference. So here we come on to these next four, they're all different heights but if I move them in the light probably you can see they're all shiny-ish fairly polished. So these are all again extruded acrylic. Virtually no difference between air assist and no air assist and then all of these here are varying speeds with cast acrylic, air assist and no air assist. And again I will guarantee that if you check those out I mean particularly all this lot here because you can see they're, they're all just happen to be reflecting the same. No difference between them at all. One of these was done with the uh, 20 kilohertz high frequency engraving mode and one was done with just normal common mode. The smoothest one which is nearly okay was 20% common mode and this one here which has got striations on it was in fact 70% uh, special mode. So what did we learn from this first session? Well even though we've got a silky smooth traverse action and we've got a lovely continuous power and we've proved that this time we still get striations in acrylic when we try to cut it. Those people that said that striations are induced by the stepper motor were perfectly correct but not entirely so because there's another natural set of striations that appear to be there in the background. So in the next session we will see if we can set about reducing the marks caused by the stepper motor by a process called flame burnishing. What are the parameters that we need for flame burnishing? Well that's what we're going to find out. We'll also try and find out how the focal length of the lens affects the shape of your cut um, whether or not the depth of focus has an effect on A, the shape of your cut, and B, the depth of your cut. So those are the basic goals for the next session, unless we get distracted by something else, of course. So until then, cheerio.